We're clapped in. Boom. The return. Why don't you get Real that up life. next to you? Act like you've done this get before. Get this all up in my face. Yeah. I, I got to clean the granola out of my teeth. <laughs> my, my, <laughs> keto, my keto PB and J granola. You can keep that away from your mouth while you good. clean your teeth. Mm, I'm sure good. that's not a great, a great listen for those eat, in a car right now. the rest now. of that stuff out of the cracks of my teeth during this podcast. That was good. I don't know what I just ate, but it was good. It, it is was, good. It was ketogenic. Yeah. So. The cafe's got all the goodies. Mm. Well, shit. I mean, I, I have a couple places I want to take this, but you're always into the latest, greatest, and I'm constantly learning mm. from you. You even told me about this... Uh, we, we obviously we do the pissing contest on sleep scores, but uh, and you're always better. I won. What do you do for sleep? Because this is such a massive thing. People don't even realize how important it is for fat loss, recovery, cognitive function. You fucking name it. It all boils down to sleep. So let's talk about your sleep habits. I eat, eat some chicken breast and masturbate and lay back <laughs> and watch that deep sleep score. Just climb through the roof. It's amazing. It works every time. Yeah. Uh, it, it depends. Um, when I'm, when I'm at home, the, the normal sleep hygiene stuff obviously dominates. I get cold, so I sleep on chili pad, uh, and I put it on boost function. So it goes down to 55 degrees. I don't have that when I travel. Uh, so when I travel, I take a cold shower before I go to bed. So chili pad is for people that don't know, it's a mattress topper. Uh, Tim Ferriss blew these guys up and I circulates cold water. Yeah, underneath and it just underneath. goes like right on top. So if you have a, yep. a a wife that you sleep with who likes it a little warmer, you can still drop it down. You so can have the really, his and hers. Yeah, like the his and hers towel. You can have the his and hers pad. She has a pad. It's never been turned on. Two That's years, right. never. <laughs> no, no one. She's not even interested. But it's there. If she, if she, if she were ever <laughs> so inclined, but it literally has never been turned on. Um, so underneath the chili pad at home, I like this concept of of healing the body while you sleep. I just like to heal my body, you know, no matter what I'm doing, you know, so when I'm working, I've, I've got the, the juve lights behind me kind of shining the red light. My so body. do you work with like a suit top, but no pants on that way you can get the direct light from the juve to your balls with, with, I screw the suit top, nothing on, you have nothing yeah. on, but, but the juve light, you only leave on for 20 minutes. If you do photobiomodulation like that for too long, you actually create excess free radicals. Okay. So you, you don't want to overdo that. It's the same. A lot, a lot of these things that make the body better you know even nootropics like uh, methylene blue is very popular right now you mm -hmm. do too much of that you create excess free radicals you do too much of um there's another device called the violite which is which is great for is that the intranasal one that yeah you in, me in, do at intranasal house? light little little laser light cap it's really good for amplifying mitochondrial activity and nitric oxide production in neural tissue but you leave that on for too long and you create excess free radicals you know any of these things act on the same principle as hormesis almost you know you stay in a cold shower for for two hours and you might be kind of fucked up from that so mm -hmm. you, you you want to you want to be careful so photobiomodulation i'll do that for for 20 minutes and that's it or, or when i'm writing my book i'll go sit on one of those uh pulsed electromagnetic field chairs and uh flip on there's there's another device i know that this is sounding kind of kind of nerdy uh called a, a nano v and it's like a dna repair device and it circulates this water they're actually down here we're a paleo fx and they they had a booth at the expo oh, but I'll, I'll i'll stick that that kind of wand or has a nasal cannula that you can put into your nose and where where a nasal cannula should go based on this not an anal ba cannula. based on the title yeah. nasal cannula uh so you know a lot of times when i'm when i'm working i just i do things to make my body better so same thing when i sleep you know so i have the chili pad which can also help out with your nervous system repair and recovery when your body is cooler while you sleep but it also amplifies your deep sleep cycles anything you can do to decrease core temperature will do that so the room's at 64 degrees the chili pads at 55 degrees um i don't load up with a lot of blankets but i am getting into this idea of weighted blankets uh, it kind of activates your parasympathetic nervous system when you have something just slightly heavy on top of you holding so you. they make like these yeah they make like these 20 25 pound weighted blankets and now i forget the brand i have on my bed but they actually breathe really well they're they're not stuffy and warm mm. as you would expect them to be uh and when i travel what i do is i'll just have like a top sheet but then i put pillows on top of the top sheet and you almost feel like you're weighted down and okay. it's this, this really kind of cool feeling uh underneath the chili pad i have this device called a body balance mat and that is that's a pemf device so 
it's the same thing as if I were I were camping, right? So you're grounded, you're earthed, even if you're in a high rise condo or whatever. And I spoke with the people who make that mat, and I spoke with Chili Pad, and they've actually talked to each other. And apparently, the water in the Chili Pad kind of amplifies the effect of the pulsed electromagnetic oh, wow. fields that, that come off of this body balance mat. So I basically just got two mats underneath me, and you can't feel them. I'm like the princess in the pee when I sleep, so I'm pretty pretty particular. But <laughs> you, you can't feel any of this stuff. You know, it's just kind of kind of like laying on your bed. So I sleep on this bed at home called uh, an IntelliBed. A, it's a very good breathable mattress. It doesn't get really warm, so the bed doesn't heat up either, and it's extremely comfortable. It, it it's designed to be like memory foam, but it's a little bit more firm, so it okay. supports your body. You don't sink into it. Uh, you don't wake up with hip pain or anything like that. So, uh, so cold is the first thing. And when I travel, I just take a cold shower. I make sure I don't go to bed warm. Sleep with the top sheet and, and throw some pillows on there for a little bit of weight. Um, keep the room dark. So when I travel, I use one of those mindfold masks. I think that's the best sleep mask. I was using the, um, that wrap around sleep mask for a while. The sleep master sleep mask, which is another really good one, but the mindfolds even better. It blocks out even more. Uh, sound is another in addition to light. So I always have some kind of an app that's playing sound by my bedside. And if I'm sleeping in a house with a bunch of other people, or there's a lot of commotion going on. I've got noise blocking headphones that I put in and they have headphones that work for side sleepers called sleep phones. So if you want to sleep on your side, they're like soft headphones that don't kind of dig into your face okay. like a, whatever, like a Bose noise blocking headphone would. And the two apps that I typically use are, uh, one's called sleep stream. It's like a DJ for sleep. It'll play binaural beats. It'll play pink noise, white noise, brown noise whatever um, <laughs> i've heard of white noise but i think yeah, most people so are what the hell is pink so it's noise? different different frequencies they then they just give them different colors and okay. based on the latest research pink noise if you're going to choose choose a color is the best noise for deep sleep so i set that in pink noise mode hmm. and what that does is just covers up ambient noise but then you can also if you if you want to you can put little piano tunes in the background or you know spa noise or even kind of like these almost almost psychedelic ish sounds that are, you know, like a wah, 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 and that, that'll kind of lull you off to sleep as well. And they also have binaural beats in there. So like I'm saying, like you can, you can just put your own mix together and binaural beats will play a frequency in one side of the headphone and a different frequency in the other side of the headphone. And uh, the, the Delta between those two frequencies is the brainwave that it elicits. So if it's playing 295 Hertz in the left ear and 300, five hertz in the right ear you'd get a 10 hertz frequency if you're going for like a like an alpha brainwave zone or you, know, you could choose delta or theta or whatever okay. you want. go a little deeper yeah the, the other app i like especially if i'm using any any kind of uh, uh psychedelic or anything like that for sleep or or something like uh we were talking about ketamine the other day uh is there's an app called ziz p-z-i-z-z and that thing's really cool. It's got like 30 different tracks that I, I find are just amazing. If you have like a mindful sleep mask on and some noise blocking headphones, you just go to this whole different landscape while you're asleep. Mm -hmm. And that one's really cool if you're, you know, if you're, if you're toying around with, um, you know, whatever, you're hitting a vape pen or, or you're taking some ketamine or something like that before sleep, you just have this, this amazing dream sequence while you're asleep. So you got uh, your temperature, you've got your light, you have your sound. And then uh, last thing is just my, you know, my laptop doesn't come near the bed, which is always a temptation when I travel. I want to work in bed. Now the laptop's always somewhere else in the hotel room or, or somewhere else in the house. Never comes near the bed. And then, um, you know, the phone, there's, you can Google um, a red phone or a red light iPhone. And there's a little button you can push on your iPhone if you program it right to remove all the blue light from the screen even beyond what the sleep mode built into the phone has. Yeah, you showed me that on our on our hunting trip in Hawaii. Yeah. It's yeah. a pretty cool function. It just gets rid of all, all blue light on the phone, period. So you can't, you, you don't get anything. It's like firelight, which is really nice if, if you do want to, whatever, look at Instagram before you go to bed or, or check a few things before you fall asleep. So um, those are a few of the things. And then I, I think I like this concept that a good night of sleep begins when you wake up like that's when sleep architecture begins so 
what I mean by that is, um, you know, I'll, I'll travel back up to Washington state from here. And when I am, uh, traveling from East to West and I'm at home and I wake up at, let's say 4am at home, because for me, having come from back East, that's 7am, uh, that can be annoying. I, I, I would rather not wake up at 4am cause then I'll just be dragging later on in the day, you know, falling asleep at the dinner table with my family. So what you do in a situation like that is you wait to cue your body until the time that you actually do want to begin to wake up. So your main cues for your circadian rhythm are light movement and food, right? So you'd wait to eat breakfast until it's actually breakfast time in whatever area of the world you happen to be in. So, you know, if you do wake up at 4 a.m., you don't, you don't get up, you don't have coffee, you don't have food, you don't have anything, right? So you don't prime your body from a digestive standpoint. You also don't prime your body from a light standpoint, meaning a lot of people will wear blue light blocking glasses at night, right? They, they think the blue light blocking glasses make sense. They do to wear them at night to limit your blue light exposure at night, but you can also wear them in the morning, right? So you put on something like a blue light blocker glass, you don't turn on a lot of lights in the home. You keep your phone in that that night mode. If you have one of these light filtering pieces of software on your computer, you make sure that's in night mode too. And you just treat the morning like it's the night until the time of day that you actually want to wake up arrives. Then you blast yourself with light. You have a meal. You get an exercise or mobility session in. And that works very quickly to reset your circadian rhythm. I mean, you, you can do it in one day with that type of strategy. So that's what I'll do when I'm traveling is, is use light movement and food strategically to reset my circadian rhythm. Cause I, you know, I, I travel a lot, like I'm constantly on the road two or three weeks out every month. So I'm always having to reset my circadian rhythm wherever I'm, I'm at in the world. Uh, and then from a, from a supplementation standpoint, um, I'm, I'm very careful with caffeine or anything like that after about 4 PM. All right, so I've, so I've had my genetics tested. I'm a, I'm a fast caffeine oxidizer. If I were slow, it'd be closer to noon based on the half-life of caffeine. But anything after about 4 or 5 p.m., I avoid caffeine. If I need a stimulant, I use nicotine because it's in and out of the system very quickly. Like you can use nicotine up to an hour before bedtime and still be just fine. So if you had a dinner party or whatever you want to stay awake, you use nicotine gum or nicotine droplets instead of a shot of espresso or something else that has caffeine in it. Or the Swedish yeah. snooze. I'm a big fan. Or of the snooze. Swedish snooze. Yeah, yeah, those 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 are closer. Th those are pretty high. Those are like 10, 20. They started. I think eight. The Goldberg yeah. Rappe. But yeah, yeah, I got the I got the twenty volts. Those, I don't like the way they joke. taste. I don't like the taste of tobacco. I like more like kind of a minty gum. Or there's minty a fresh company called Blue Brain Boost. They make uh, just straight up pure nicotine droplets. Same great which, company too for the methylene blue. If they, they do methylene blue as well. And uh, actually a wonderful, wonderful stack for earlier in the days. You take methylene blue and you microdose that with uh, CBD and nicotine. That's a mm. very clean burn. And you can get it like a, like a sublingual trochee now. There are some companies that sell this. That's a mix of methylene blue, nicotine, and CBD. So it's like five migs of CBD. I want a, that, I want a link to that in the yeah. show notes. So if yeah. you can send that to yeah. me, I definitely um, want to try that yeah, out. I'll, I'll find, I got a few in my bag too right now. Awesome. Uh, or, or my, uh, my, my family. I have five, fuck, you're the first of yeah. five podcasts today. So I'm going to need to run that. Yeah. yeah I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll drop you on. You have a blue mouth all morning. Oh. Uh, and uh, in, in the evening though, what I'll do is uh, CBD oil. And then uh, typically what I like is something that's got just a little bit of like a, a 5-HTP or a microdose of melatonin in it. And right now I'm using uh, Dr. Kirk Parsley's sleep remedy for okay. that. Yeah, that's good so I'll have a serving sleep remedy and pretty high dose of CBD. I'll take about 100 milligrams of CBD, which seems like a lot, but most of the research on CBD and enhanced deep sleep cycles pushes closer to 300 milligrams. Oh, so, wow. Which is a lot when you consider that when you get a dropper bottle of CBD or a CBD supplement or whatever, like a serving is 10, you know, and there are some companies pushing close to 30, but you know, that's, that's one tenth to one third of the actual dosage that helps you to sleep. Yeah. So, for me, I mean, I, I'm, <clears throat> we get a lot of free stuff as, as I'm sure you do. Yeah. I, I know you do. Um, but yeah, the highest end CBD products that I use are still 30 mg per full dropper. So yep. that's I'm taking 10 full droppers to hit yeah. that dose. I yeah. haven't done the 300 yet. I've done the 150 and that's something I totally feel. Whereas yeah. with with 
one or two droppers, it's still 30 to 60 MIGs, it's a lot higher than most recommendations. I don't necessarily feel that the way I would do the 150, but I'm interested in trying the 300 now. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then if you wake up during the night, anything that enhances the release of an inhibitory neurotransmitter called gamma immunobutyric acid, or GABA, that works well if you wake up, let's say 2 or 3 a.m. and you want to get back to sleep. CBD doesn't do that so much. Um, passion flower extract is very good. Uh, valerian is very good. I think you guys have a couple of GABA precursors in New Mood. Yeah, Valerian's in there, 5 yeah. HTP. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The only issue with that is it, it's a capsular delivery, and so it might take a little while to hit your system. Um, typically, I'll just have like a little passion flower dropper, so you just mm. put it put it sublingually. Um, chamomile works pretty well, too. Like You can keep like a little, little bit of chamomile powder or chamomile tea next to your bed and sip on that if you wake up during the night. That's so, really good. Yeah. Well, let's talk. Uh, I mean, let's let, let's talk about psychedelics. We touched on this this uh, we, this ketamine nasal spray, which now I mean you can get from any cool doctor, um, <laughs> functional medicine cool doctors. doctors. <laughs> any cool doctors will hook you up with this, uh, and obviously it's it's available on the street. But um, I want to touch on some of the ways that you optimize uh, psychedelics for performance, and whether that's sleep performance or you know, just hacking creativity and energy systems. Like what are the different ways that you've found to be effective for that? Yeah. I mean, we, we need to, of course, couch this in, in terms of legality for any, you know, water, only when you're in Costa water, Rica, you a lot of sanctioned athletes or off season yeah. athletes, like just, just, just know, know the boundaries, you know, use, use, uh, use global and make sure any of this stuff's legal for whatever, whatever sport you're competing in. Um, so a, a few of the things that I find particularly handy, uh, of late, one we've already touched on is, is, uh, ketamine. And I'd done ketamine infusions before overseen by an anesthesiologist for t- typically that would be used to, uh, to release childhood traumas or to simply be able to, to relive elements of your childhood, pull those back up. And it's very good for, for pulling things up from a historical context, reliving those and releasing them. Right. So like, uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll use, uh, my, my wife as an example has, has also done it. And she had a very difficult childhood when it came to schooling, right? Like she grew up dyslexic and, uh, was forced to learn spelling and reading and writing in a manner that that was very, very difficult for her. Like she sees words as shapes. Like she sees the word, the word, the, it's not T-H-E. It's just the, the shape of, mm. of the T, the shape of the H, the shape of the E forms the shape of the word the, and that's how she reads. And so she had a very difficult childhood trying to be forced outside the box or, or forced into like, you know, the box of how you're supposed to learn to read. She didn't realize that was traumatic for her, but it actually suppressed her creativity. So when she did ketamine, like one of the first areas she went back to was, it was either her teacher or her mom, I forget, like trying to force her how how to, how to learn to read the right way over and over again. And she was crying and she was frustrated and, and she like her brain just didn't work that way. And, you know, she came out of the, came out of the, the ketamine experience, you know, crying and, and having never really realized how traumatic that was for her. Hmm. And after releasing that trauma, the very next day she started painting again, you know, it'd been a long time since she'd broken out her art supplies and really tapped into that creativity, but she was able to release that and begin to work on her art again, you know, and now she, she's painting and she's making these amazing murals and pieces of art. And that's, that's what triggered that for her. Now, what I've found with ketamine is with this new intranasal ketamine, you can, you can put a few doses of that in each nostril and, and, and you, you snort it in. And, and I like to do this at night as I'm, as I'm laying asleep to go to bed and you'll put in one of these apps uh, like that that PZIZZ app I was telling you about is is very very good for this. So there there's a track on there I really like called Heliophoric. And you put this in and you you do the ketamine and you lay back and you just think of anything from your childhood that you can vaguely remember. You don't have to direct your thoughts that specifically. You don't have to try and think of something traumatic or think of something painful from childhood. But you just think of, of something, you know, like whatever, playing, playing, playing ball in the driveway when you were a little boy or, you know, maybe taking your, your dog for a walk or whatever. And you start to play in, in vivid recall all these experiences from, you know, for me specifically from my boyhood, not traumatic experiences because I, uh, you know, I, I didn't have a very traumatic childhood. I was just like pretty plain Jane homeschooled in Idaho. Like I, I had a pretty, pretty easy 
boyhood. Pretty standard K through pretty, twelve homeschooling. Pretty standard K through twelve <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere in, in North Idaho. Like not not a lot can go wrong. There there there, there, there weren't a lot of uh, gangs and drugs. So what I found though is that by doing that, and and I'll just do that one or two times a week, it's brought me closer to my boys because I've been able to recall my boyhood in vivid detail relive these memories from boyhood that I'd almost forgotten, you know, what, what I enjoyed to do, you know, having my friends over and playing basketball in the driveway with our old school boom box going till, till midnight or, um, you know, fashioning myself a little spear and making a bow and arrow and going out with my little boxer, Bruno and going through the forest and hiding and, and, you know, shooting at stuff or, uh, um, you know, digging giant holes and building these amazing underground forts. And, and I'll wake up and I'll be like, oh, I got to go out and do this with my boys. Or we got to go out and start work on that tree fort. Or we're going to play family basketball tonight after dinner in the dark with the floodlights on in front of the house. And so it's really cool because by being able to tap back into my boyhood and remember what it was like to be, you know, my boys are 11 right now, right? Mm -hmm. What it was like to be 10, 11, 12 years old, I've been able to actually foster a, a deeper connection with my boys. So ketamine that's been cool uh you know you ask more about cognitive optimization um you know and, and for that i think it's stuff a lot of people are, are probably already aware of i i like to you know occasionally microdose a little bit of psilocybin um i i went through a period of my life where you know i, I did a lot of ayahuasca and, and dmt and psilocybin and lsd and and did did trip doses and you know and, and, and journeyed and found myself and dissolved my ego and I'm over all of that. I'm pretty disillusioned with that. And, and I actually don't like to lose control over my cognitive function and, and would rather use these things now just to be sharper. So, you know, uh, one or two times a week, I'll take a very small amount of psilocybin, you know, like a um, you know, 0.5 gram dose and blend that with lion's mane and take something like a beetroot or some other sort of, of uh, blood flow precursor. Okay. And use that as a cognitive pick me up, um, or as as a nature pick me up. You know, I've used that during hunting. Use it for for hiking. Use it for any type of nature experiences because it uh, enhances your sensory perception, your sense of smell, your sense of sight, etc. Um, depth another, perception, a lot yeah, of, a lot of perception. Good stuff yeah, there, yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's, it's it's a it's a very cool plant in that respect. Um, same thing for for LSD. You know, there are, there are companies like uh, the website Lysergy, for example, that will sell, uh, you know, something like PLSD. Very, very easy to just go online and get. And I'll, I'll get like a, a blotter tab of that and dissolve a little bit of that with alcohol in a dropper bottle so I can dose very precisely and just 10 to 20 micrograms of LSD for a day on which I'm doing a lot of writing because writing is typically for me a process of you know when i'm banging out a blog post on you know let, let's say uh, sleep for example for me that's that's a mix of creative and analytical work you know it's a merging of the left and right hemispheres of the brain so for something like that lsd works very well so i i like that for writing and that's something i'll use about once a week i'm careful with any of these just because you do amplify dopamine and serotonin levels and and so you could you could potentially exhaust your neurotransmitters or, or create like a, a neurotransmitter depletion or imbalance if you overdo this kind of stuff. But uh, microdoses of LSD, microdoses of psilocybin. What do you um, find the main differences between the PLSD? Because John Beer is a buddy of ours and, uh, yeah. you know, he's, he's, he, he was telling me about that website and, and some of the different things that they offer. And there's just, it looks like it's almost like uh, the menu at, at uh the cheesecake factory yeah like, there's five, too five many five dmt and five meo dmt and then they have all these different dmt derivatives they uh -huh. have all these different uh they're called lysergamides you know any, any derivative of lsd is a lysergamide i think for a for a maybe a seasoned user of psychedelics there would be a perceptible difference um i i wouldn't even consider myself a, a highly seasoned user of psychedelics for me i i get a similar effect from, okay like a, an ACO versus an MEO DMT or a, uh, or a PLSD versus regular LSD or, you know, whatever. So I, I don't notice that much of a difference. If you go to, uh, the, the Wiccanaut page for a lot of these psychedelics, they'll, they'll list the, the differences between them. And a lot of times when you're reading through these wikis for each of them, it's, it's essentially the same thing. The only difference would be the 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 symptom or the effect onset can sometimes differ in terms of the amount of time you know 15 versus 30 versus 40 minutes 
uh, where the peak occurs, you know, whether it's two or three hours down the road, how fast it's out of your system or what the half-life is. Okay. Uh, but the effects, uh, uh, aside from, from the time they take to kick in and how long they stay in the system are, are pretty similar, um, from, from, you know, lisergamide to lisergamide. So I, I don't think there's that big of a difference. And then, um, you know, the, and then a lot of the things that are easier to get your hands on or, or more within the bounds of legality, I think are still really effective. Um, uh, for example, um, what's one that, that, uh, that I found recently that worked really well, um, uh, uh, racetam, like any of these racetam or, or paracetam or anaracetam type of compounds combined with methylene blue. Like that, that's another very, very good pick me up. Gives you good clean high for about five to six hours. Uh, caffeine nicotine stack, you know, the old school writer stack. I mean, that, that works very well for a long day of writing. It's easy to get your hands on a, on a nicotine toothpick and stick that thing in your mouth and sip a cup of black coffee. Have you found much difference between the racetams? Cause one thing I noticed was, you know, anaracetam can be better for anxiety and has mm-hmm. like a calming clean high yeah. oxyracetam is very energetic and it can make people a little racy if they're yeah. already prone to anxiety. Yeah. Um, but I always, you know, you got to stack these with some form of yeah. alpha GPC or some type of choline, yeah. tartrate, just yeah. anything that exactly. can exactly. upregulate that. I loved, and it's funny, I didn't even realize that I was stacking this before, but I used to stack methylene blue with oxyracetam and alpha GPC. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a hell of a stack. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a good point you make. A lot of these things, if you stack them with any acetylcholine precursor or have a good, good mess of scrambled eggs and walnuts beforehand for a more natural form of choline, you get less of a crash afterwards and you get less long-term choline depletion if you're using these type of things regularly. Uh, another thing, speaking of choline, that, that's, a, that's a really good one-two combo if you tend to be more sympathetically driven or have like a low HRV or vagus nerve issues is huperzine mixed with acetylcholine because a lot of times your your acetylcholine levels tend to be depleted if you're highly sympathetically driven always in fight and flight mode mm. you have poor vagus nerve function or low hrv and you can take um i believe doesn't alpha brain have huperzine in it alpha brain yeah. has alpha gpc huperzine and okay yeah really so you've, cool you got products, both yeah. in there but yeah, yeah. using a, a blend of huperzine and acetylcholine is very very good for vagal nerve function and there are people, uh, there, there's, uh, I recently discovered this, a link between acetylcholine depletion and gut function, meaning that a lot of people who have uh, constipation or IBS or lower GI issues, what happens is the ileocecal valve can get stuck in a closed position. And one of the things from a chemical standpoint that can open that back up and relax it is huperzine and acetylcholine. So you can actually use this as a strategy, like in the morning when you first get up, like you have a bunch of huperzine and acetylcholine, have a cup of coffee, and that can a lot of times initiate a bowel movement in people who are constipated, especially if you blend that with like the use of the, uh, you know, like the SoRite device that works on your psoas, or mm. you use any type of like vibrating massage tool over the ileocecal valve, you can have an amazing bowel movement in the morning. And I've used that with a couple of people who are constipated and it works really well. Damn, that's so, good. Yeah. Let's let, I mean, you just touched on something I wanted to, I wanted to pick your brain on. We've, Fuck, we've had a lot of podcasts in the last few days, but what we've had, uh, you know, we had our buddy Dr. Michael Ruscio on. We had Sharon from Bonafide Provisions on, and um, you know, they spoke a lot on gut health. I wanted to see what your thoughts were on, you know, product. I, I didn't really get into products, but obviously, you know, you're a supplement guy. What do you think of the product Restore and different things like that for like really healing leaky gut syndrome, which yeah. seems to be an issue for quite a few people? Yeah, so Restore, uh, Dr. Zach Bush's product. It's And know, I have zero like a, affiliation with these yeah, guys. It's a so let me just so, soil-based that. extract of, of lignite that uh, specifically seals the, the leaky gut based on its interaction with the zonulin protein in the gut. And it was specifically designed to mitigate the issues with leaky gut brought on by glyphosate exposure because that's one of the issues with glyphosate. That's one of the reasons people will go to Europe and say that they're able to eat more, eat more bread and pasta in Europe. And a big part of that is not because, you know, there, there's kind of this myth going around that uh, the grains in the U.S. are bred for high-yield crop and therefore higher in gluten, and it's higher amounts of the, the wheat agglutinin or the, the gliadin proteins that are in the crops in the U.S. that cause people to be able to do just fine with grains and pasta and bread in Europe but not be able to handle that in America. 
That's not true. The levels of gluten are pretty similar. The difference is that there's more glyphosate in the crops in America. And so what happens is the, the gluten is able to cross that gut blood barrier more readily and also contribute to the leaky gut issue more readily because the glyphosate is essentially you know, poking little holes in the gut lining. Mm. And lignite, or this active ingredient in the product Restore, is supposed to mitigate those issues. Um, I think it does. I've, I've seen some of Dr. Bush's data. Um, I use it. I give it to my kids. Uh, my, my kids take a few different supplements, and that's one of the ones that they take regularly particularly if they're eating grain-based or bread-based products. Uh, and uh, the other reason that I use it is because even though we grow all our own food uh, or, or the majority of our food, I hunt a lot of our meat. We get our eggs from our chickens. Uh, I do have well water, and we live below a bunch of farmer's fields. And so I'm concerned about glyphosate runoff in the well water. So before breakfast, lunch, and dinner, my kids have a shot of Restore, and I do too. Um so I, I am a fan of that stuff. I think that you could probably also do things like uh, or, or approximate the same type of activity with uh, colostrum, which also acts on the zonulin protein. So you could use a colostrum powder or a colostrum capsule. Yeah, Dr. Um, Thomas Cowan, who you've had on the show, really is a big proponent of colostrum. When I yeah. lived in California, I used to be able to get like fresh colostrum from, uh, it was raw colostrum from grass-fed, grass-finished cattle from a company called Organic Pastures, but most people in the country, and now that I'm here in Texas, you can't, you have a very difficult time buying no. any type of raw dairy. Yeah, and, and, and so, breastfeeding mothers are going out of supply. They're just getting, getting exhausted from, <laughs> from the demand for colostrum. High, yeah. high demand. Yeah. So, I mean, what are, what are some of the ways that you've found like really good colostrum that's actually beneficial because, um, and maybe maybe you do take capsules, but, but going from having this really fresh raw yeah. organic source of colostrum to now have to buy it in capsules just yeah. seemed a little off to me yeah we have goats so okay we're fine uh so we we have nine nigerian dwarf goats so i mean uh, you know, there's there's plenty of colostrum to go around but before that and this is this is the company i typically recommend to people is there's a little organic goat farm in western washington called mount capra has a really good bioavailable colostrum and it's even it's a smaller protein than what you get from a cow so it's even even better absorbed in the same way like goat's milk is is better than cow's milk just based on the protein thermodynamics but they're they're very small they go in and out of stock so it, it's it's tough there's another guy I interviewed who has a pretty good colostrum that uh, i didn't realize that the growth factors and some like the lactoferrins other protective compounds and colostrum become activated when they contact salivary amylase in the mouth. So he does like a powder that you dissolve in your mouth and then swallow. Uh, his name is Naraj. I think it's Naraj Neljic. Uh, um, you, you can find my interview with him because we talk about colostrum for like an hour on my podcast. But he has Send his Send us own, the link. We'll link to it. Yeah, sure. he has his, his own brand as well. He's called calls himself the Renegade Pharmacist. Um, and I, I don't know where he's getting his colostrum. That's bovine colostrum. Okay. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Mount Capra is the goat place and then Renegade Pharmacist has, has colostrum or, you know, if, if you, if you want to go out and buy a Nigerian dwarf goat and milk its little teats, that's an option as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you, you, you've also got, you know, glutamine, bone broth, or there's some other ways to skin that cat. So, um, yeah, that, that is one of the few supplements my kids take though. I had them genetically tested we did a like a, a, a we tested a lot of their snips we went through a company up in canada that can test more snips than 23 and me uh, initially they're the twins i just wanted to find out whether they were identical and aside from from one snip uh, which is the snip for aromatizing testosterone into estrogen so so taryn's got the man boob gene aside from that they're, <laughs> they're, they're completely identical so he he can't drink out of plastic bottles uh, but they also, uh, they have the gene that is responsible for slightly lower amounts of brain-derived neurotrophic factor production or BDNF production. So I've educated them about the importance of things like, uh, you know, especially as they age, aerobic exercise, sauna exposure. Uh, they drink a cup of lion's mane tea before they go to school now because that's really good for amplifying BDNF production. Okay. Uh, they, like me, lack the gene that allows for efficient production of endogenous vitamin D in response to sunlight exposure. So they both take a, like a liquid vitamin D, vitamin K blend. And um, 
they also have the gene that is responsible for lower levels of superoxide dismutase or sod production. So they also take a, like a, a sublingual glutathione. So they take glutathione, they take lion's mane, they take vitamin D, and they take that restore supplement. That's their stack. That's a good stack. Yeah. And your boys are 11 now? 12? Yeah. 11. Yeah, 11. Yeah. Yeah. Super good, brother. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the last things that I wanted to chat with you about now that I've got here, we're in, we're in a small men's group that you organized yeah or for dads raising boys yeah and the importance of which uh it can't be overstated you know look around at our modern society and everything going on um and really just it's it's not something that happened overnight but we're in a spot now where i think we're at a critical point in our history for how we raise our boys and I wanted to ask you and kind of pick your brain on what are some of the different ways you're looking at rites of passage and the things to make our boys turn into men and to allow them to foster into the best possible right. human beings they can right. be. An actual marking or recognition of the passage into manhood, the passage into responsibility, the fact that a woman, when she goes through her period, has a distinct passage into womanhood. And, and that, 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 that's her mark. And when we look at a lot of, of, you know, indigenous societies or hunter-gatherer societies, we see everything from, you know, getting hooks pierced through the skin and hung from the ceiling and twirled around and beaten with sticks and dropped and, and then sent out to, you know, this, this is one of the Native American ones, you know, then you attach buffalo skulls to the chains that are hooked through the skin and they got to drag those through the fields for three days and finally get them ripped out or wait until the flesh rots out and, and they come back and they get their, uh, if they're, if they're, uh, want to become a warrior, they get their pinky cut off. Or if they're, if they want to prove themselves truly brave, they get their index finger cut off and then boom, they're men. Uh, so far, my boys aren't that interested in, in that rite of passage. <laughs> they're not doing the bullet. Yeah. The, yeah. The another, another hand. one is, uh, you know, you, you, they, they, I, I forget the, uh, I think it's an Amazonian uh, culture where you just stick your, your hand in a, in like this glove that's full of fire ants and they just eat away at your hand and you got to leave that thing on for, I don't know how and long. And you can't wince. There. If you wince, then you're, yeah, you got to keep your a life. straight face. You can't uh -huh. be a warrior Poker otherwise. Face. Yeah. Um, and then we also see just this idea of of silence, solitude, meditation, um, you know, something very similar to just like, you know, Jesus Christ going off and fasting for 40 days in the desert, in the wilderness. And, you know, maybe that was, was in a certain way like a rite of passage for him. And now... Uh, there are uh, there there are many people, especially in our in our health and fitness circle, kind of tapping into this idea of when your when your boy is twelve or thirteen or fourteen or fifteen years old, taking them and and training them leading up to this this uh, time to actually have the wilderness survival skills to be able to go alone by yourself into a forest or into a desert or into a jungle for anywhere from seven to ten days being left just with yourself, a wool blanket, a backpack, maybe a knife or, or a bow and drill for making fire, and you survive on your own, you know, in, in complete isolation, just learning how to find your own independence, how to survive for yourself, how to, how to go through hardship, how to go through difficulty. And then when you come out the other end of that, typically there's some form of a ceremony. Sometimes it's a plant-based ceremony with ayahuasca or psilocybin or marijuana or that young man's first exposure to the responsible use of plant medicine which of course is important because that's also accompanied by ego disillusion right and so that passage into manhood is marked by that and there's you know kind of kind of a uh, a cutting of the cord right this idea that after that point the young man is expected to find a way to help chip in to support the household to pay for their own food or to get their first job that allows them to begin to save up for college or in some way actually translate that responsibility that they've attained through their through their rite of passage into you know brick and mortar boots on the ground actually providing for themselves or helping to provide for the family and and i think that that something like that is feasible you know versus fire ants and and getting you know hooks pierced through the skin for for a, 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 lot, a lot of young men, you know, if, if their parents are able to organize something like that for them. And so, you know, in our case, our kids have been doing uh, Tim Corcoran's, who's been on your podcast before, his uh, wilderness survival camp each summer. And typically they'll do some of his, his overnights during the winter 
to begin to give them the skills necessary for the rite of passage that they'll do when they're 13 or 14 years old. And I'm personally helping them out with a lot of these things too. Like we have the Spokane Survival School dropping our whole family off in the wilderness next month for seven days, right? Mom, me, the boys, backpacks, wool blankets, that's it. We just survive as a family for a week. Um, you know, they're they're taking their first animal tracking and, and butchering course in September. They're doing their first bow hunt for wild pigs in two weeks. So I'm trying to get them to the point where, you know, probably that initial rite of passage where they're just seven to 10 days off by themselves in the wilderness is going to be something that, that they're able to handle. So you got to go into these things responsibly. You just don't, you know, rip a kid out of school and drop them <laughs> off in the forest. But, but yeah, ha- having the ideas, you're raising a young man that at some point in their life, they're going to embark upon that rite of passage and you're going to recognize their transition into manhood is important. And if you're already a man and you never had a rite of passage, like I didn't, there are organizations that, you know, there's like, you know, Kokoro seal fit, or maybe for you, it's going to be like, training for and completing your first Ironman triathlon or going out to the the Boulder Survival School and doing their two week, you know, hunter gatherer course where they leave you out in the middle of the desert and you gotta eventually, you know, hike back into Boulder after surviving out there in the in the desert. You know, there, there's a lot of ways to approximate that rite of passage, even if you're an adult. And I know, you know, again, the uh um uh, Twin Eagles Wilderness School up, up by me, they do these rites of passage for adults too. So you know, even if you're an adult already, I think it's important if you never went through rite of passage to put yourself through something like that to where you can say, okay, I've, I've, I've gone through and I've learned what it really means to, to be a man and to, to be able to just survive with my own two hands and not be dependent on anybody. Yeah, absolutely massive. Dude, you crushed yeah. it again. It's yeah. been excellent having you on. I'll have cool, you on man. every time I see you, just Sweet. like Paul Check. Yeah. I love you, fun. brother. Thanks, Thanks for being here. Love you too. Thanks for the peanut butter and jelly. (laughs) You got it.